on the political spectrum, I'd be far left. I'm a councilist and moreover a left com. Um, you can find me in the Discord. You can find me on Spotify at Dylan Blay, Instagram at Dylan Blay underscore. Um, yeah, generally speaking, I'm taking a super reformist approach and an anti Vanguard approach tonight. All right. <laughs> All right. Next up is Oz. Welcome. <laughs> hey, what's up? Better late than never. Um, yeah, so you want to introduce yourself, tell people where you lie on the political spectrum and where people can find you. Yeah, I'm Haas. Um, I'm a Marxist-Leninist. And uh, I was interested in left communism when I was 14 years old, like 10 years ago. So there's that. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, all right, so here's what we're going to do. Each person can give an opening statement. It can be as little as one minute, no longer than five, about the topic and your stance. After that, we'll open up the floor. To those watching, if you have any questions, tag politically provoked who your question is addressed to. We will jot them down and get to them at the end. We'll do closing statements and final thoughts after the Q&A. So, Dylan, let's get going with our opening All right. Statement. So, today, I'm here to discuss with my opponent the practicality of reforms and revolution. I'll also be representing a more Bernsteinist, reformist approach to achieving socialism. I think, personally, the Marxist-Leninist approach to socialism bears no practical value in the context of 21st century America, and many of the political strategies that come with Leninist philosophy, such as vanguardism, are obsolete, especially now considering the power exerted by the bourgeois. Many historians agree that Leninism has the logical conclusion as well of Stalinism, and although I'm not an orthodox Marxist, my ideal outcome, in my opinion, is the closest one one can get to the Marxist definition of communism. Okay. Um, yeah, my position is basically that um, there's no such thing as Marxism without Marxism-Leninism. It's a complete absurdity. The only reason anyone cares about Marxism is because at one point in history, 25% of the world's population lived under Marxist-Leninist governments. And that is that, those, that's actually the people who made Marxism actually relevant and mean something. Uh, hundreds of years, not hundreds, but you know, a century and a half after Marx uh, died. And now the most powerful country on earth with over a billion people uh, the ascendant power, I should say, the soon-to-be most powerful country on earth, is led by a Marxist-Leninist uh, party. Now, there's a lot of claims uh, that are being made about so-called Leninist theories of vanguardism, which doesn't make any sense to me as someone who actually knows the history. Uh, le you will not find these, these phrases in Lenin's writings. Uh, it was a truism for all Marxists in Lenin's time that the proletariat can only fulfill its interests through an independent party. Um, this was true for the European Social Democrats at the time. Uh, it only stopped being true, possibly, uh, during the period of uh, the so-called left communists, which uh, emerged around the time after the First World War, as a reaction to the decay of Western social democracy. Um, finally... Uh, I would like to challenge Dylan as to where in Marx's writings does Marx define communism as a, a you know a certain type of society with X and Y characteristics. As far as I know, as someone who's actually read Marx himself and not uh, Twitter leftists, Marx said, "By communism, we mean the real movement, which sublates the present state of things." He was pretty blunt about the fact that there's no blueprint for communism. There's no idealized vision for what a communist society is supposed to be. Um, I mean, this much is evident in both Marx and Engels' writings consistently. So I'm not really sure where he's getting this idea of, uh, you know, an end goal of communism from. Go right. So I guess we're opening up the floor here, right? Basically, the definition I'm trying to achieve is the, you know, I'm sure you've heard this one countless times. It's the stateless, classless, moneyless society, right? And in a sense, I'd argue that I'm more of a revisionist than anything. So the goal is to try and get to that definition, whether it was written by Marx or not. I really don't give a shit. However, that being said, I think that's the ideal outcome, considering there is value to statements like the workers should own the means of production and we should have a dictatorship of the proletariat. So... Really, I, what I'm trying to get at here is that it doesn't matter to me what Marx wrote. However, whatever Marx wrote did lay down the groundwork for the ideas that I'm basically espousing today. And how Whether is that? people misinterpreted it or not. It okay, how, how is that? How did Marx lay the foundation for your ideas? Go ahead. Okay. 
so I guess you can look at like, uh, well, I think certain ideas perpetuate, you know, uh, this very pro working class set of ideologies, right? Like when we look at the labor theory of value, something like that is absolutely something that was invented by the classical political economist and not Marx himself. Right. But Marx espoused it. And the thing is, is that when Marx, what do you mean he espoused it? Many argue that Marx was the first devastating critique of the labor theory of value, anticipating its eventual abandonment through marginalism and others. I guess Marx is not necessarily a labor theory of value person as I'm more of a subjective theory of value type of person. However, that being said, the way in which this was written about led to, you know, whether it was misinterpreted or not, this is sort of how we got to where how we are was today. that? Can you elaborate about how it was written so we can actually be clear about why we're talking about Marx? Because we don't have to talk about Marx. I mean, I just want to know. Why I mean, we're talking generally about speaking, it. I'm not really here to talk about Marx, but I think that you know, in terms of like when you know you see the Communist Manifesto and the impact that's had on broader society, I think that you know, which uh, impact do you have in mind? Do you have the impact of um, leading to an outcome of the world's you know, largest countries being ruled by communist parties, effectively transforming the world? Or are you talking about like Noam Chomsky talking about it in like... No, 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 I'm talking about obviously like the Bolsheviks and the October Revolution. Like the people who made the whole thing relevant, right? Yeah. I I don't disagree with you on that front. I I agree in every context that they're like socialist countries. There's nothing to disagree upon there. So what I find... So what I want to get at is... What I'd like to ask you is... um. You're basically saying Marxism, Leninism has no applicability in 21st century America whatsoever. Um, and you call yourself a council communist and Bernstein and all this. So you're basically talking about the things that were never successful in seizing power uh, or affecting any meaningful change or transformation for their countries. And you're basically saying that the people who were successful are actually the failures. So I'd, I'm interested to know why they're failures in your mind. Yeah, so my big issues with things like revolutions, especially when we apply it today, is that it's impractical to apply something like a revolution. We look at the context of the October Revolution. We're talking about Imperial Russia under the Tsar, right? There's obviously not a lot of infrastructure. It's a monarchy. The people are getting fed up with it. There's, of course, broader socialist movements like the Mensheviks and all of these other parties, right, that represent, you know, sort of these communist ideals. Sure. And necessarily, while that was practical at the time, I don't necessarily think that can be applied to a country like America today with the, you know, the most overinflated military budget in the world. And the fact that I think the only way that we're going to ever achieve some type of actual socialism in America is through reforms. Okay. um, so did Marxists invent revolutions? Is that what you're trying to say? No, no, no. So what did Marx, what did Bolsheviks and Marxist Leninists, what do they, since you know, I mean, I guess you know, right? What do they actually say about revolutions and the relationship they have to the process of uh, arriving at political power? Do Marxist Leninists Marxism Leninism? Like, I'm not sure yeah. if you want to talk about like actually what Lenin wrote or yeah, like or practice. Because I was I was more so referring to the practice and the fact yeah. that there was a revolution, you know, yeah. that did take place. And I feel like this type of Leninism is which really wait to there was America. a revolution, but whose fault was that? That there was a revolution was it lenin's fault or did the revolution happen before lenin wrote his april thesis and the october revolution following an actual revolution that the bolsheviks had nothing to do with so likewise for the chinese did they enact uh, some kind of revolution or was that the republicans there were chinese republicans who enacted the overthrow of the Qing dynasty the japanese who invaded chinese soil i mean Marx, I, Marxist Leninists don't really have a reputation for voluntarily just declaring that they want a revolution and then acting upon that impulse. The, the whole point of Marxism and Marxism Leninism isn't to just put your foot in the ground and say, we need a revolution. It's mm-hmm. more so recognizing the objectivity of revolutions and preparing a party. Uh, making a party means, sorry, means that's a weird word, making it uh, prepared and tested and cognizant of the fact that revolutions are things that happen objectively. The state does not come from thin air. The state has material premises and it will be tested by those material premises. And in those such moments, the party must be prepared for a revolutionary moment. I don't know why communists or whatever you want to call them should shoot themselves in the foot and say, no, revolutions will never happen and the state is eternal and it'll always just exist and it'll never encounter institutional or structural crises like the ones we're seeing now in America 
we should just sit back and let Biden and the liberals take care of this, and we should not seek to seize hegemony over the war of how the American people make sense of this institutional uh, crisis. Right. So I think it's more over an, an important thing that the in, a way we initially get our foot through the door is with social reforms. Like you look at politicians, whether you like them or not, Bernie Sanders, I mean, uh, if we talk about like, you know, Medicare for all and we put that into practice, that's going to, you know, remove some type of hierarchical distinction between people who are in the working class and people who are, you know, the so bourgeois, right? It's if I'm just kind of confused. Maybe, yeah, maybe I'm focusing too much on labels. I'm a little bit confused. You call yourself a co council communist, but in one of Lenin's writings, which is left wing communism and infantile disorder. Oh, no where he critiques uh, the council communists and other left communist uh, tendencies, mm -hmm. he actually lays out pretty explicitly that communists operating in the ad so-called advanced Western countries, they may have declared uh, bourgeois democracy dead in their head, but it's not actually dead for the masses. This is ad almost ad verbatim what Lenin said. It may be uh, abolished in your head, but it's not abolished in reality as far as the masses are, are concerned. So communists... Um, who in this case would be Marxist Leninists because they're following the teachings of Lenin, have to be have a patient attitude, be cognizant of the objective and material realities, and have to work uh, within the existing form of politics, which means you have to work in parliaments. You have to work to get so-called mm -hmm. reforms passed that actually comprise the site of political struggle, the real one that exists, not the one that you think is is the best one. I mean, this this has been the consistent communist policy throughout the history of the 20, 20th century. By communist, I mean like the the common turn and um, the Soviet led and later to a lesser extent Chinese led communist internationals. No one has ever like had this view of this adventuristic or voluntaristic view where it's like. Yeah, we should just have a revolution and ignore the current political realities. It's like if you're a, re a party, you're building an independent party, you just say, we want to overthrow the government. I mean, how can you just say you can't just say that, you know, you're right. You, you won't have the support of anyone. Um, you're not going to be working within the existing political reality. And, uh, you know, like Marxist Leninists would call this a kind of adventuristic ultra left and anarchist uh, deviation. Yeah. So personally, I'm, I'm obviously not with that. I, I was just more here to talk about the context of which we can actually lower discrepancies, you know, in wealth between the bourgeois and the proletarian, right? Which I think is an important thing to think about moreover than objective revolutions that happen. And I think that if an, a revolution were to happen, because they do happen regarding material conditions and societies that exist and take place, right? I think a society in which uh, sort of the, you know, the ruling class or the bourgeois have less power and they can exert less power on top of all these people, right? Like the proletarian in which we tax them more and we use that money to sort of raise people out of poverty because we are capable to distribute these resources in a way that well, positive benefits society around but them. He, the, the problem is that I'm not against, obviously I'm not against weakening the power of the ruling class, but you will not accomplish this. I mean, you may as well, that will that may as well lead to a revolutionary crisis if the state has its basis in a ruling class and you are seeking to undermine the power of that ruling class history shows that it is inevitable the ruling class will resort to extra legal and extra state means to mm -hmm. repress their opponents um, the state does not have a real independent existence outside of its basis in a ruling class Especially right now in America, we can locate this specific uh, ruling class and its various uh, factions. Right, so, and I, I completely agree with you that the ruling class obviously resorts to extra legal, you know, ways of keeping the proletarian down. However, uh, like when you look at this and you see the fact that we are taking resources from them and we are lowering discrepancies, right? Because I'm trying to provide opportunities to these members of the working class through getting them, you know, access to health care, education, all of these things so they can sort of raise themselves up and out of poverty right i don't want them you know if we're if we were to have a revolution which i see as more of a um sort of desperate last push as opposed to a because i i just i want to ensure that we have infrastructure in place and that the yeah. only essentially the revolution that we are having if we are to you know sort of remove anyone from power it's these 
bourgeois capital owners because necessarily okay. I don't think that we need to like um, get rid of any types of like politicians, more so the people who stand in the way of the revolution, like okay. outright. So in the history of Marxism and Marxist Leninists inherited this, this was in the period of social democracy. There was a distinction that was made between the minimal program and the maximal program. So the minimal program are the things that you're talking about, right? Infrastructure, whatever happens to be the point of political contention of the day, Medicare for all. And then the maximal program is like the further out kind of seizure of power, the proletarian dictatorship, that kind of thing, right? Right. Now, um, the pursuit of the minimal program is the basis of how you operate in, in politics, right? But mm -hmm. what Marxists anticipate and recognize is that if you're actually successful in really building a movement uh, which is capable of seeing through these changes that threaten the power of the ruling class, it is inevitable, and this is why you have to be prepared, it is inevitable um, that you will lead to a, a political crisis in which the ruling class will make the necessity of revolution or something of that manner up at a certain point uh, inevitable. Right. Now, so I guess we really kind of agree on this then, don't we? Because I, I, I do agree with that. Of course, the ruling class is going to make it so it's necessary at some point. You know, when they start to stand in the way because they realize that their power is being essentially seized from them or tried to be taken away from them, that we, you know, essentially, they have to fight back. So at, at any point, the way we take the, you know, sort of these people in positions of power out of power is through some type of final push, whether it's the, like, a revolution or anything like that whatever means of well sort of, usually what happens you know, is that they resort to forms of extra legal intervention that mm -hmm. lead to a breakdown of the legitimacy of the state and the institute they resort to like they use the state to do things that the state itself considers illegal and extra uh, mm -hmm. institutional and this yeah. basically annihilates the state. As, this as is more sort standard. of an important factor that I think is important to take in consideration when I'm talking about reforms, which I think is... Right, but the, the whole point of Marxists need to create a party for, as far as, not just marxist leninists but Marxists in general, the whole point is to create a party that is capable of weathering this, surviving this, and preparing itself for this eventual outcome of having an alternative um, vision for statehood that that will allow it to contend for hegemony. Um, right. the, the theory of Marx, I mean, this is even before fascism, right? The idea of the Social Democrats was um, the destruction of liberalism is inevitable, but uh, it will lead to a, some kind of horrible tragedy in the short term without being if it's not led by the proletariat uh basically that's fascism right fascism who i mean there was no lenin that was forcing this fascism to happen it happened um you know the the, the, the some kind of fundamental change in liberalism is inevitable right I, I agree with that but like are you i, I just want to understand what kind of context you're coming at this from is this like the tendency for the rate of profit to fall or like it's it's a it's okay yeah it's a combination of a number of things so on the one hand you have economic crisis that's a big one right mm -hmm. and with economic crisis comes a breakdown of the legitimacy of the state you also have another thing marxists would call um revolutions in the forces of production and according to marxist theory um the content uh, the form of the state and the institutions always lags behind the content of uh, the forces of production revolutionizing. So when this happens, all of a sudden, the state and its institutions become outdated with regard to some kind of more fundamental historical and technological change. And at that point, uh, it becomes a site of political antagonism and so on and so on. So there's many factors. It's not just the you know, specific economic crisis, but it's also the inability for Social states. Crisis. Yeah. Okay. Wow, I, I'm just, I don't know. I was surprised that you and I would agree on this, essentially. I mean, I think you and I generally were both pretty well on the same page for this end of things. I, I, I don't know. I just, I, I try to look through, you know, some of your content on YouTube to see if I could find like a concrete position on this. 
and it, it was difficult to find, but I didn't have much time to sort of comb through that, right? Um, I mean, we can move on to Vanguard parties, right? Because there's something I'm sure you and I have like an absolute disagreement on. Okay, sure. Right. So my argument is that Vanguard parties, when used, and this is this extends past Leninism, like we look at the Nazi Vanguard party as well. Um, I think the transferal of power into the hands of revolutionaries just creates a newer, a newer bourgeois class. Okay. What transfer are you referring to? So essentially, if you have a vanguard party that comes in and has a yeah. revolution against the state, and they come and seize the power in the state, and we essentially we have these oligarchic sort of because I, I think that that the revolutionaries themselves, when they come into power, yeah. they still have control over the resources the state previously had disposal of, and of course, since there's, I don't necessarily think there's a dictatorship of the proletarian in the sense that there's not really a direct democracy, and or the fact that these vanguards can use the resources against the people to oppress them. Moreover, a changing of power into different hands. Okay, this is quite a sweeping claim. So the reason I asked you why is there a transfer of power first before we get into the other stuff is the idea that there's a transfer of power to the party assumes that there is some kind of spontaneous um, sovereignty of the people that the party steals. But actually, there is no expression of sovereignty of any people, of any class, of any collective outside a specific organ of representation and reflection. And this is what a party is. The issue that you're describing, finally, for the second issue, and we actually can look at history to see if this is actually what happened or not, what you're describing is corruption. That's what it would be called, corruption. So basically, people are using the state, they're using their position of power uh, to fulfill personal pathological ends, right? You know, to Wait, get so you do not think that that's like almost inevitable with a vanguard party considering you set up these conditions that allow a small class or small group of people to be the ones to immediately have these assets okay the issue they is can exercise authority okay. over people which okay. is my big issue with the whole concept of a vanguard party right do you want to let me like, i'm not going to deny the practicality of it in the okay. context of china under mao yeah. right you, you want to let me under, finish? Or? Even under Dang, right? Like, yeah, yeah. Dang made these market liberalizations so, okay, and reforms. Okay. To let, let's, let, theater, can, right? can we hold, hold your horses, please? Do you want to let me finish? Or? Yeah, sure. Okay. So what you're describing is corruption because even though the... It's really awkward to say, like, the resources are in the hands of the party, but how? Is it, like, directly... Is there a form of direct control or is it more indirect through enterprises and organs? Like, does the party directly have to, I mean, you have to, we'd have to get into like information theory and talk about the details of Soviet planning throughout the various stages of its existence. But no, the party did not have like direct control over everything to the point where individuals can just be openly corrupt. Now, the problem of corruption is an inevitability of any state. It's not unique to the form of a party. It is any state on planet Earth is going to have a problem with corruption. What we do find in history is that actually, communist states are uniquely disposed with the ability to eliminate corruption, uh, more even more so than uh, bourgeois democratic states, because in bourgeois democratic states, corruption, even discounting the ones that exist secretly, is legal. You know, it's legal in the form of open bribery of politicians by special interests in order to fulfill their goals. And, you know, politicians using their special personal connections and so on and so on. So um, the Wait, issue so of corruption. I need, I need, I need yeah. to just say something really quickly. Yeah. Do you not think that in the immediate aftermath of there being a revolution, which often leads to a period of crisis and lack of infrastructure and systems and social safety nets so that people can rely on these, uh, leaving these sort of decisions in the hands of a select few people where they can make these decisions, especially considering immediately we put all the power in the hands of these people because... Which you haven't. That's the thing. You you haven't... So you said we put our hands in the power of the people, but there is no we. Again, any collective mass people, uh, any country, right? It doesn't have a spontaneous form of unreflexive sovereignty. Its expression of sovereignty will be mediated in the form of some kind of representative organ okay so there is no we giving them power uh, right so do you think giving control to that representative organ can allow the representative organ to oppress okay. the people 
If you are that representative organ is controlled by a small group of people, you are, okay. and of course, this doesn't give the actual working class proletarian. I, 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 I don't know if you have a hearing problem and you can't hear me, but I'll repeat it again. When you say we are handing control, who is we? What control did you have before you handed it to them? Who are you to hand them control? What what are you? Well, who are you? Are you an organization? You're essentially a worker leaving it in the reins of these revolutionaries. And yeah, you may have had a say in who the revolutionaries are, but how they act after you, or how how they okay, act. So, so now you're talking about the transfer talking, of power occurs. Is you're talking about workers now. So you, what you mean to say is workers hand the control over to the party, right? Right. So what form of control did workers have before they so-called handed it over to the party? Well, not much. I mean, none you were, at all. Talking about they, the had none, of... they had none at all. Because in right. order to okay. have control, you have to have organization. And organization is the beginning of a form that stands apart and is intelligibly distinct from the unreflexive flux of spontaneous masses. Okay. So other than a philosophical difference, what, what differentiates the vanguards from the previous people who, you know, because if there's a revolution, there's an immediate yeah, transfer the, the, of the, the, the vanguard represents the interests of the people. So I'm a vanguard and I just say, all right, I've gotten myself into this position by manipulating and conning my way around and doing all this stuff. Is that how they got into their position? I think, that's a, I think that's a rank... Revision of history. Is that how the vanguard, so-called vanguard, got into its position? That's not true. In, in what circumstance was it true that the vanguard party got into the position of power through the use of Machiavellian cunning and manipulation? That's just not true. Right. So do you not think that that's not very possible? Because this is a damn well thing that could happen with, like... Okay. Yeah. Well, then Politicians do this routinely. And, you like, if you want to talk about Machiavellianism, like, hell. I mean, even look at, like, Stalin. That was his favorite book. Like the prince. Okay, we can talk about Stalin in a second because I actually do want to talk about Stalin um, in a second. But I think what you're not really recognizing when you're overinflating the significance of corruption is that politics is actually an objective, intelligibly distinct sphere uh, from the sphere of civil society and its various private individual interests. In other words, there is an objective sphere of politics. Now, if a so-called vanguard is just going to completely ignore and forget about its original mission and just become immediately corrupt, it probably won't have, it probably won't be able to maintain power for very long. That's the simple truth. Um, states. Wait, uh, so what kind of checks and balances come into play to hold the vanguard party accountable? The notion I mean, of they're check immediate control over the resources yeah. if they're the representatives. Okay. There, we're talking about a lot of things at once. So checks and balances is a form of what Marxists would call bourgeois formalism. And I'll explain why. So in the case of checks and balances, you try to make the objective and material premises of state rule, you try to formalize those, right? Because the state is not all powerful. That's just objectively true. No state is all powerful. It is literally impossible. States have a material premise. They have a material premise in a certain class, or they have a material premise in general in the people, and the people over whom they rule and preside over. Without this, a state could not last, right? As Putin said, no state can survive without the legitimacy coming from the people. In so one you don't way think or another. the state can coerce Well, well let me finish. Please, of the state? Dylan, Dylan, let me finish my point, because it's really important, okay? What Marxists would reproach you with saying is that you don't actually need to formalize these material premises because they're active, actively suspended in reality. If you study the history of communist states and even today's communist China, you will see how the Communist Party is very receptive and very cognizant of the feedback that it's getting on the ground from the people. Um, and there's a dynamic relationship between the two. So when you ask the question, what are the checks and balances? The checks and balances come from the public itself over whom they're residing power. Communist Party is not all powerful. It is not all knowing and it is not omnipotent. It gains right, so its legitimacy and its um, logistical and operative uh, mechanisms from a dialectic relationship with the people. Right. So you don't think a party could basically come in and, you know, allocate resources in a certain way, shape or form to say the military to keep the military over like ruling and, you know, essentially kind of coercing people into doing jobs with the threat of death or things like that. Because people are going to be 
essentially, if it becomes a work or die dichotomy, then they're probably going to choose well, work. In in that case, first of all, um, it's not a work or die dichotomy. It's a in a circumstance of war, which is the Civil War. It's a work or die dichotomy. Not because you're going to get shot if you don't work, because if you don't work, no one's going to be able to eat. Right? Food doesn't come from the sky. So if you don't work, how are we going to feed ourselves and clothe ourselves and shelter ourselves, right? Someone has to do this, this work uh, in a period of crisis when you're pressed directly to those conditions. Um, now, second of all, this stuff about allocating resources to the military, well, in the later stages of the Soviet Union's existence after World War II, a, a huge proportion of its resources and so on were allocated to the military. But does this represent a form of corruption or does this represent the Soviet Union trying to secure itself against the real and imminent danger posed by an aggressive um, West and uh, America who had revitalized their own military industrial complex, clearly anticipating some kind of war. Um, if you can't protect your state, you will be squashed and eliminated. So how are you supposed to protect your sovereignty and your uh, own state? Right. I mean, so when you're, you're, when you're advocate, so you 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 would rather advocate that Soviet peoples and other peoples living in communist countries they should just allow foreigners to completely seize their country and see as they do fit with their country. Not really. That's not necessarily. But if if the you case. don't have a very powerful military, that's what's going to happen. Right. So you can have a powerful military, which is obviously the way that you know Bolsheviks after World War II went about it, right? I mean, China as well, they have a very powerful military. But essentially, to sort of avert the kind of crises that come with allocating so many resources directly to the military, instead of actually, like, because there's going to be discrepancies from a point of where the military gets all these resources, the resources that are going to be given to the people are lesser. So essentially, what I'm trying to advocate for here is through reforms, essentially, I think America, you're, you're, which is one of the, the leading power in the world right now, right? Yeah, and we can't your, retain their Your military. example is completely bankrupt because you used an example of the Soviet Union's need to have a uh, powerful military as an example for why reforms are necessary. But in order to argue that, you have to argue that in the context of uh, the events of the collapse of the Russian Empire, uh, your path, your special path, would have been preferable or more possible even than uh, the Bolshevik way. So, so that's the thing is, is I'm not necessarily trying to argue this in the context of Bolshevik, you know. Then, then you like, can't... That, that you, point you time, can't, I'm trying to argue, though, for yeah. modern-day America, right? I want to talk about contextualizing. But you, the reasoning you know, you're giving for why it is in modern-day America we need so-called reformism is because you're saying a powerful military will be necessary. Well, a powerful military at the time was still oppressed by the, you know, well more expansive and powerful West. So I think that the only way one can really achieve true socialism from here is have the dominant power in the world essentially reform to socialism in some capacity. That was the prevailing view um, among Marx, Engels, and Marxists for, and the Bolsheviks themselves until the facts of history proved otherwise. The fact of the matter is that... Um, you cannot gamble on the fact of the matter is that it was a misinterpretation of that was really coming from the baggage of hegelian idealism that revolutions will begin from the advanced countries well as we're seeing this theory has already been disproven china was centuries behind america when the communist party seized power and now china is genuinely catching up and remaking the world um the theory is being disproven right before our eyes that America, uh, success and victory of socialism depends upon a revolution in the most powerful country because America will not be the most powerful country forever. Right. So my big issue is that uh, America using the resources at, at its disposal, because you and I agreed earlier that the strongest power in the world is going to you know, push back if it is threatened. Right. So I think you and I agreed on this. So when yeah. America, essentially, it's going to become a battle of China and America, which I'd argue it's already started becoming. And and the big concern is that the superpower that is America is going to repress China. If China, you know, is leading the socialist movement, 
Yeah, and they're, they're under China, constant threat by China, America. China has a long-term strategy that is not dependent upon what we in America do. We, uh, so-called communists in America, need China. China does not need us. We are the ones who have to learn from China, the most successful... Right, so China's going to become threatened at an eventual point by America, whether it's... In, and I'm not talking about already communists is. In, living in America. They already are under threat by America. Yeah. And the liberal sort of democratic establishment is the one, you know, threatening China. But, but they they constantly China, misinform and spread it, misinformation about China to yes, get people to turn their backs in the, the West on the ideals of China. I agree. And eventually but, it's going to become threatened enough that China is going to get serious pushback from America. And America is going to, uh, I'd argue, go for some kind of war with China. I, I agree, and, but the leaders of China are anticipating this and preparing for it. And if you ask me... The odds do not look good as far as uh, America's prospects at being successful in this endeavor. So that's that's a big fundamental concern for me, though, is that the most powerful democracy or not like liberal de democratic bourgeois country with these resources that it has, you know, available to it is going to come in and essentially stop the entire movement. And it, it's, it's capable of that in this very moment. And if. You know, China becomes more and more of a threat. That's what it's going to come to. And I'd argue that militaries, you know, in the West are going to form alliances and find ways to oppress China. So and destroy it, what they I'm don't. not sure what this point is about. I agree that uh, communists should work to do the best they can to win in America. I agree with that in okay. order to prevent so, war and so on and so on. I'm just making the point that China is not waiting for us. So, right, so I'm trying to say that the best method of going about achieving global communism and socialism without actually having an immediate threat or presenting threats to, um, like, well, everyone's, je basically lives of everyone are jeopardized when, you know, America starts going, well, you have to go to war. Well, we offer these incentives to the military and the people that, that, who fight in these battles, right? So I'd argue, which I've tried, been trying to argue this whole time, that the reforms that one can make in America to get to a point where we become the sort of, you know, the, well, the proletarians in America and Canada and all throughout North America and the, sure, you know, obviously. basically established strong infrastructure, Western democracies and Western nations, okay. which have their issues rooted in liberal democracy. However, there's opportunities available in which, you know, the global communists can seize, even if it's minor positions of power, which... I mean, it might not be like it might not necessarily make a difference in the long run. However, any effort in, in you know preventing the loss of life and casualties caused by essentially revolutions is what I'm arguing from this ultra reformist approach. And then eventually, like it, it's basically a brand of like centrist Marxism. You've, I'm sure you've heard that term thrown around, right? That I'm in between. I tether in between reform and revolution. However, I'm leaning reform because I think that's an important approach to setting up the conditions in which the proletarian can lose, you know, have the least casualties, suffer the least, you know, grave, dangerous, and, you know, okay. uh, like are you, are you consequences doing? of war, right? Okay. And essentially set up okay. a better, I guess you'd say overall world, considering now communists and Chinese, like Chinese and American communists and socialists are the ones who are, you know, at the forefront. Are you done? Yeah. Okay. I think the issue here, and I tried to point this out to you before, is that you're treating politics like a strategy game where you have control and you actually can choose what outcome it is. Revolutions are very unpleasant things. That's the truth. There's nothing pleasant about revolutions. I agree. Right. But so wouldn't you say then the most immediate thing we can do is try to control for all the variables possible because we have certain I think factors the best around thing, us and surrounding us that we can manipulate. I think the best thing. I think. I think the best thing you can do right now is stop interrupting me because I think you're just kind of embarrassing yourself. How am I embarrassing myself? Well, because you're you're not letting me. I, I don't know. I'm I'm trying to explain it to you, but you just keep interrupting me when right, I try so to. Right. So I responded to. I'm trying Dude, to respond. I just did it again. <laughs> you no, know, he just finished his statement there, in which. I you didn't said, finish anything. You just interrupted me. You made a statement, and I'm responding to that statement. How do you know that that was my statement? Because you stopped talking. Can you just shut up for a second? Christ.
Politics is not a strategy game. We may agree that revolutions are unpleasant, but that does not address the question of whether they're an inevitable fact of reality. If And we, all we have to do to understand that they're an inevitable fact of reality is recognize the fact that no state is eternal, no state is divine, no state is omnipotent. States come from dust, and unto dust they shall return. States have a material basis that cannot be controlled, premised, or legislated by the forms uh, that are within the power of the state itself to establish. In other words, the basis of state power is something the state itself cannot legislate formally or establish. So if we recognize this fact that revolutions are an inevitable, however unpleasant they are, this is like if you're a hunter and you're in a jungle and, well, do you like lions and do you like tigers? Probably not. They're pretty unpleasant. But if you're really going to provide for your family in this jungle and be a fucking man, you better prepare yourself for those lions and those tigers and you better mold yourself in the image of a warrior who can fight lions and tigers and be cognizant and accept that reality. Likewise, a revolutionary isn't somebody who goes around uh, advocating for a revolution because they want to enjoy the chaos and turmoil of a revolution. A revolutionary is just someone who prepares for the in inevitable fact and who's sobering up to the cold, hard truths of this world. It's like growing up. And moreover, what confuses me is that I thought that on the question of this business of revolution, the matter was settled. These were your words, not mine. I thought now we're moving on to the question of the Vanguard Party. But it seems like you're all over the place talking about China and America and militaries. And I just don't know what topic we're on. Here Wait, so my big issue with that is that it, it seems to deny the fact that politics has in fact been a strategy game historically. It's all about who conceives power and immediate positions of it which is why i don't understand what a, like what angle you're coming at this from because revolutionaries can prepare themselves obviously for to fight this big war and fight these revolutions and you know seize power however it would probably be in the revolutionaries best interest they're you know the faction in which they're trying to lead to you know success to have the least casualties and suffer the most this is going to get the most people on board with your movement and, you know, ensure the success of your movement, essentially. Again. Politics has an element of strategy to it, and I don't know why that's not being factored in here. Because, po okay, this is why politics is not a strategy game. In the case of a strategy game, you are an impersonal, uh, omnipotent actor. You are confined by a certain level of rules, but your, your camera's uh, hoisted up into the sky. You're like a god looking down. And you get to choose what happens. You get to choose the outcomes that happen, right? But in real life, you actually don't get to choose what reality is. Reality has an objectivity that you have to surrender and submit to. Otherwise, you will fold and be crushed by it. You will just be eliminated. The Bolsheviks prevailed because in the context of the Tsar's Russia, they speed. it was a speed run, right? If you want to talk about video games, it was a speed run. They speed run the process by which the most tough, resilient, wise, smart people were the ones that endured and eventually seized power. Because the people who had your mentality in Tsar's Russia, they would just die in Siberia and then they'd fold and then that's it. They didn't have a, they didn't stand a chance because they weren't tough enough to accept the cold hard truths of the reality. And so one can accept the cold, hard truths of reality and still play politics as though it were a game. People are subjugated constantly to the laws and the conditions that surround their state. If you don't think that people function out of an individual mindset with this imperative for survival and all of these other factors, because if someone has the ability to exert power over other people, they can remove the resources necessary for this person's survival. They're essentially coercing them to defend something that they may not want to defend. So on top of this, all they have to factor in their own survival rate and all these other things. What, and I think the are, denial of that is completely what are you absurd. I, I don't know what you're talking about. Are you saying that? What are you saying? So I'm saying that politics, essentially, especially as people who live in the Western world, if we're trying to factor, you know, in a way for Americans and communists to seize power over here or find a way to power over here, 
it is going to have to work within the framework of liberal democracy because we don't have the resources available to us to essentially find some way to lead some kind of uprising or movement. Like the movement is so incredibly small that there's going to have to be a level of this politics game played in order to essentially be successful. Okay, I don't see how that shows that politics is a game. It's not a game. It's, it's absolutely a, a game. If I'm a like democratic socialist or whatever who gets elected into public office and I find ways to make people agree with me, I've got to play these games like, okay, here you go. I've, you know, I've bended my knee and I've given Medicare for all and I've yeah. given all these policies and all these reforms to make people want to agree with me. So the game I'm playing here is that when I essentially offer these policies to the people, it's not just in an effort to increase their quality of life, but it's to make them agree with me. And or like here's, the here's, here's the problem. The here's the problem is that communists are not bending their knees. Uh, you can be bending your knees. That's fine. Um, bend, this is what when I, I'm saying this because when you talk about politics, you kind of sound like, like Mussolini. Like you're not actually participating in the class struggle. You're just cynically kind of uh, in a detached way kind of just operating in it in order to fulfill some kind of final ends this isn't a communist position even as far as the relation between the minimal and maximal program is lenin is very clear about the fact that it's it's not just the fact that you have to use the system it's that you don't have your own system you can pull out of your ass you're in reality you're participating in this reality it's not a game this is a reality it is a real site of struggle and you have to be cognizant of that fact and participate in it because that's where the reality is. It's not a question of what is the final goal or what is the final ends. Um, it's a question of that. Right. So the material conditions surrounding the fact that I'm trying to make the world a better place for everyone, the working class especially, when I play my little politics game, which I've said, and you can say this, that I'm being cynical, yeah. that I'm doing this you know, Machiavellian thing or whatever. But I'm acting like when I legislate and choose to be, you know, some kind of legislator, I'm acting in sort of altruistically in the best interest of the people. Yeah, and that's order, that's uh, my way. That was you know, the the bourgeois socialists of the Communist Manifesto, the Fabians who thought that they were elevated above all struggle and that they were empathetically acting like Daenerys Targaryen as a benevolent kind of aristocrat uh, for the people. Right, so I don't need to act like a benevolent aristocrat. I can come from like a very grassroots position and still help people through playing the game of politics. If that's so, what leads to better outcomes so for the why working don't class, you, I why, only why care don't about you? the material conditions that surround them. So I don't I, see why there's Hold on, but this. there's people who think like you, like AOC, and AOC just sits on her ass and can't do anything when she's in power. So, I mean, maybe you can do it. Go do it. Don't let me stop you, you know? Hey, I'm going to try and do it. That's the, essentially the plan. And yeah, I think AOC and her... Okay, and, 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 and is there, is there going to be like... Clear. Are you going to have like um, a measurement of like, okay, now I realize I failed and I didn't know what I was talking about. Like, how many years will it take for you to realize that you're wrong? Like, if you fail. I mean, I'm going to have to like actually experience this firsthand. Yeah. If you want to talk about experiencing objective reality, then I'm going to have to go through the paces of essentially leading my little conquest of socialism or whatever this is. But yeah. I don't think that with, through playing the game of politics, you can deny the very real um, yeah. benefits in the Western world that someone like Bernie Sanders has provided to the movement. Yeah, but I think we would disagree about why. you know. And then the second thing is, do you watch Game of Thrones? No. Are you sure? Yeah. I think you're getting a lot of things from Game of Thrones. Nope. Are you sure about Prince. that? Yep, I've never Are watched an sure? episode of Game of Thrones. Okay, well, I, I I think we've gotten off topic, and you're talking about your idea of what you want to do, and I, I don't know why it's relevant. Like, do what you want to do. I don't let me stop you. I, I don't know, but um, I don't see how you put forward a convincing argument for why uh, communists should not strive to have independent parties. So I don't have an issue with communists having independent parties. Like that's not my problem with the vanguard my problem is with the relationship between the proletarian and some of the vanguards and i and think what is that, that relationship the society in which we play politics like i've said so is a society first, the in which first thing we i want to ask you is we, we, we need to reduce the amount of harm felt by the working class and this is you know you're saying oh you need to prepare yourself for this fucking revolution all this shit right 
My thing is, it's, if this is avoidable in any way, shape, or form, we can try to avoid it, and we can move in a direction where we can, you know, reduce the harm. That's essentially the goal here. And of course, there's going to be suffering. Of course, there's going to be strife. And I've accepted that. That is a just a fact, like you said, of objective reality. However, that being considered, any way to reduce or minimize the harm, and of course, minimize the loss of people who actively participate in the movement, because if, if there's bloodshed, that means you're losing valuable members of the part or of the party of the movement. So I think and you're basically think arguing play that... politics and get away from that. Okay, I don't think this is a discussion about the philosophy of harm reduction, which I don't agree with anyway. But okay. so you're speaking for yourself. I don't share your philosophy that the whole goal is to reduce suffering. This sounds like a Western Buddhist, like you know, hippie shit that I have nothing to do with. But All right. what I'm, I'm trying to reel us back into a discussion about why we shouldn't, why I should not strive for an independent party. You mentioned that you do, you have an issue with the relationship vanguards have with the proletariat, and I just don't know what you're talking about when you say things like that. So the thing is, is throughout this whole conversation, you've been saying all this stuff that has to do with. Oh, you know, states will wither in the dust, but states will put up resistance. And when the state puts up resistance, this can lead to destroying the working class as well and the people who live within this country, which is why I've been talking about playing po politics this whole time, this Machiavellian approach. Well, I, yeah, I, I, it might seem like sinister, but the, the end goal is supposed to be altruistic. That that makes for like a good TV show, but... I mean, I'm, I'm sure it does, but still... What, what I'm it, trying to say is that... Okay. You, so what you're saying is that uh, I my argument was that parties should prepare themselves for an eventual revolutionary situation. And you said, no, they should not do this because states... I never said that. Don't put words into my mouth. Well, I, I, I'm not... Okay. That, that's not the what I said. Please, what I said... Please clarify that, your Wait, 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 wait. What I said was that the working class can prepare itself for, of course, revolution and remain resilient and strong and avoid, you know, succumbing to whatever happens, you know, because a revolution obviously is inevitable. We've agreed upon this. However, you don't think that the harm that comes with a revolution should be avoided if it can be? Like, there's steps one can take that, that's the operative. to ensure that problems that come with revolutions are less so. Then how will you... The denial of that is absurd. Okay, then how, how will you ensure that in those steps? So there are precautions we can take, which is why I've been advocating who we, thoroughly who, for reform the whole Who's, time. Who is we? Wait, so wait, wait. I'm gonna. I'm giving you. I'm giving you an example right now. Okay. I'm gonna give you an example. The bourgeois has the monopoly on capital, and by pro proxy, the monopoly on resources. So if the bourgeois puts up a resistance to this working class movement, basically what they're able to do by putting up a resistance to the working class movement is they're able to inflict more harm to these, you know, pro the proletarian. By inflicting harm on the proletarian, we're losing essentially this sort of ensured success. So when I take precautions in advance through reforms, you know, through higher taxes, through sort of leveling the disparities between the owning class and the proletarian, they are able to put up less resistance. This is a way I can factor into my whole battle plan, which is if I want a socialist end goal, right? By so removing power, is, removing yeah, yeah. capital from my, these- My question is, uh, are you God? You are you God is what? just my question. Am I God? Yeah. You tell me. I'm just I don't, I don't know. Not, you, you talk like yeah. you're you talk like you're a god who's omnipotent, and you have all of this. So I don't think I'm omnipotent. Yeah. However, I want you to like logically come to this conclusion with me. Do you think a working or a bourgeois class with access to less resources is going to put up as good of a fight as a bourgeois class with a monopoly on power? I mean, it has in history. The bourgeoisie did not prevail in the Soviet Russia. Right. So do you think that if the bourgeoisie in Russia had less power, it would have been an easier time for the Bolsheviks to come into power? There would have no. been less life loss. No. You don't think that? No. So you don't think that if the bourgeois had less power... There, there is no there is no less power. The bourgeoisie has power or it doesn't. If the bourgeoisie... It does have power. However, there is ways of determining which level of... Power the bourgeois can exert on other people by the resources they have available to them. Such as, 
all right, you don't think that the fact that the bourgeois has this all of this capital that makes it coercive and makes people need to come in to work at these this facilities? Is, I think you're very naive about politics. You're thinking of it like a strategy game where there's like resource meters and you just have to lower the So meter. there's not resource but, meters, but when it, but here's it, it the thing. follows logically that having more resources and obviously someone else having access to less resources, because no matter how you slice it, if the resources come out of this pool, the big pool, and go into the little pool, there's going to be less necessity for this owning class to sort of manipulate and exploit this, you know. I, I think I think you don't understand class. that when you start seizing resource resources, it's really weird how you're wording these things, from the bourgeois class, you are making an act, even if you're, okay, even if you seize a grain from the ruling class. You're making a symbolic declaration of war. It's there's it's not something where there's like a spectrum of how much you can lower it. The minute you lower it a little little bit, that's where you've begun a war, right? And that's how the class struggle. It's not how the. I mean, I'm just assuming that your framing of it in terms of like raising resources or lowering. So do you resources. think that higher taxes are essentially a active war against the bourgeois and the ruling class? No, oftentimes they're an active war against the people because raising taxes usually just raises taxes also on working people and normal people. And raising taxes on the rich is really a cope. Um, so because... we can do this with percentiles. You know, it's, it, he, I, think, I, think, I think I can simplify this discussion, actually. Maybe okay. I can get to like the root of what your position is. It kind of sounds like you're like a Malthusian who thinks that classes form... On, on the basis of a war for finite resources. But according to Marxists, there, there is no eternally finite resources. What there is, is uh, a given mode of production. And the threshold of any given society's wealth is going to be determined by the level of uh, development of its productive forces. So the real goal for communists is not to seize resources from the ruling class as much as it is to develop the forces of production uh, in a manner that puts the newfound wealth in the hands of the people as opposed to this working uh, ruling class. So I completely agree with you on this, actually. Like, I think that's a good thing. And I think we're able to do this if we like subsidize worker cooperatives and things like that in America. Well, I don't see why. I don't see why that is. I mean, uh, development of the forces of production does, doesn't mean you fund certain enterprises because you find them more virtuous or better or more socialistic. But they're, they're the ones actively getting resources, these finite, you know, material resources into the hands of the working class. This is just what you, you just said this. No, finite no, resources, if the working class essentially yeah, has I'm the I'm saying I don't agree with your mouth. I don't agree with your Malthusian position that it's a war over finite resources. I just don't. Okay, so you don't think that essentially the bourgeois class who's able to exert pressure onto the working class, which they've done time and time again, right? This is both demonstrated through history and in I the think I day. think you in a really bizarre, um, almost psychotic way, it's like you think that the economic sphere and the political sphere are the same thing and that like the these are the exact same thing and that the bourgeoisie has economic warfare against the, pr the truth is, is that politics and economics, the side of those things are discontinuous. So what's happening politically in terms of. So, for example, a political party which represents the proletariat um, is going to be dealt with by political means. OK, the primary form of the class warfare, the political class war is not going to be this battle over resources. It's going to be like, for example, laws passed by states, repressive measures. Um, media campaigns, info wars, things like that, it, it, cultural wars. It's not really going to be this thing where it's like, you know, oh, it's a matter of who has the most resources to win the strategy game. It's just not how real life works. Right. So that, that agrees with my position then, because politics, they are, you just made it sound like politics are attached to the economy. The bourgeois has access to these resources they have available to them. Can, can we stop using the word? These active, what you said there, these active media campaigns and things like that, and the lobbying is a very real thing that happens, right? To appeal to special interests. This can, is what the, essentially the words using, are doing to... Yeah, can we please stop using the word resources? It's super weird. It makes it seem like it's Minecraft or something. Do you, you just mean money, okay? You're just talking about money, right? Well, a party, an independent party needs money. 
but there is nothing holding back a party from getting the necessary amount of money to kick i mean you realize that even the democrats are adopting the strategy of small donations small donations are really the source of how you get political resources um the combined small donations i mean you have to understand something even all of this money that these oligarchs and corporate people have that pales in comparison to the combined um strength of the consumer strength of the masses um because they get their money from as you should know the cons the consumers the masses right that's where they get their resources and power from in the first place so Wait, i really need to say this because this is super important and this goes in hand with my point the reason that these consumers are paying all this money to these ruling people is because they have something they have like i said resources because money's value is only determined by how people are going to give it up to get these again like i said resources that's the important thing to talk about here and i don't know why it's it's not like, it's not yes it absolutely no, is the not. fact that you would just you know not value resources in the way that they're distributed in society is absurd to me this is the if anything reason, this the is reason the reason you can't approach to politics so resources are used to control societies and they can no, be used no, to it's, control no societies. it's not no it's not so it the, absolutely the, the, the primary that... the primary form in which private entities exert so-called control over so-called resources is not actually by owning each and every individual piece of raw material and commodities it's through brands it's through trademarks and logos and it's through um corporate enterprises and things like that and those in turn direct the production of certain commodities and in a certain direction not on the basis of reproducing the power of the bourgeoisie politically but on the basis of accumulating profit these are enterprises whose goal is to be profitable for investors specifically for shareholders mm -hmm. right in the case of corporate so there's a discontent when they want to deal with maintaining their power politically that's a different thing okay so you're making it seem like we're living in like some kind of like minecraft uh minecraft multiplayer pvp battle where it's like oh who has the most resource it's like it's not how it works dude wait but the money is used to keep it so that they are above the working class this how? is what they do with it this is oh, wait wait, wait. By paying off politicians, it happens so all the time. Exactly. So they do it through funding think tanks, institutions, lobbying, and um, funding media. Yes, That's which, what they do, right? Right. But they here, have the here, resource, which is money, because money is a resource, and they're using it to lobby and gain control. Okay. This is where and, economics and, and, but and they, politics but they get, they get their, their, disassociate them and not understand the strong okay, correlation but those, between those, them. That money is just the surpluses that are coming from their profits. It's just spare money they have to spend on that. The primary goal that they have with the so-called... It's to keep making more profit, which gives them more power over the working class. No, they do not care about power over the working class. They just care about profit. It's nothing personal, kid. It's just business. I know it's not anything personal. However, when they have this, they, they're they still taking from these people. Like, I don't understand where the fundamental disagreement is. I don't care what Jeff Bezos' intent is. What he's doing through him trying to make as much profit possible, you know, he's doing all these things, making conditions for his workers less bearable, other shit. This is just a consequence Jeff, of Jeff, what I don't wait, 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 wait. Jeff, if Jeff his philosophy Bezos. is only motivated by profit, then he's still going to find a way to make maximize his profit. It's, it's, a, it's his actually profit, it's it actually it's actually not just profit primarily for someone like Jeff Bezos for these new platforms. It's not even really pro profit; just a measurement of their success. It's really about maintaining the platform, maintaining Amazon, making Amazon, making sure Amazon can grow, making sure Amazon can invest in other things and make more things like it's not really so much. I mean, like personal power is not really a big factor in this whole thing. And I right. think you're but the consequence of him keeping Amazon afloat is it means he's going to have to squash his competition. He's going to have to squash all these other people. Yeah, but he's serving, so if someone poses a threat, which competition obviously does competition being able to be started by everyone else in a given society if they're able to you know he's gonna have to squash them in order to keep his platform afloat which means he's causing a direct consequential harm to the working class jeff bezos is trying to work in the interest of the amazon corporation and part of that the interest of the amazon corporation is keeping itself sustained 
when it keeps itself sustained, it's going to have to resort to all the measures possible to keep itself alive. Because like I said, this functions with a business too, because a business is run by people. And survival is an imperative of Why anyone's... Why do you, dude, you know, ramble like so that. much? Can you just stop rambling and get... Well, to I'm point? rambling, and everything I'm saying is coherent and makes sense. So whether I'm rambling or not doesn't matter. I'm I don't... I, 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 I cannot discern a point from what you're saying. What is your point? That so yes, my whole point, since we led this conversation in this direction, is that you're all like, oh, politics and economics are completely different things. They're separated from each other. I, I didn't this say is just that an there's absurd no... take of reality. Whether you want to say that I'm being naive because I'm playing political no, mind. You're putting words into my mouth. What I no, said. No, no, you, that's exactly what you said. And you can rewind this and go back and say, economic. Keep talking over me, dude. You know what? I'd love to keep talking over you because the shit you're saying makes no sense and has no value. You sound mad as hell. So I'm first not of mad all, as hell. Yeah, first of all. No, I'm just right as hell. That's all there is to it. And and the way you prove you're right is by making it so that you talk over your opponent so they can't reveal what a dumbass, rambling idiot you are. Well, then I'm doing a damn good job of it. Yeah, anyway, Dylan, what I said actually was not that you're alleging that politics and economics have a relationship, something I never denied. I am accusing you of thinking that they're the same thing, that they operate on the same plane and the same level. But what I'm trying to say is that they operate on different, intelligibly different levels. The correlation is so strong, though, and this is the point I'm making. They might as well be the same thing, the way that they're tied into each other no, and how they, they're used. No, they are not the same thing. No, if you, you want to talk about objective reality, right, then you'll understand that the political power that certain people have also factors in with their economic standings. The correlation is that strong. But that doesn't mean that Jeff Bezos exists to have political power. I never said he did. Just the fact that okay, he does so what because point? of the conditions that surround his life. So, okay, let me just rein this in and simplify your argument as far as I can hear it. What you're saying is that the goal is to impoverish the ruling class as much as possible because that way the ruling class won't be able to use its spare chump change in order to um, direct politics. The issue with that is that you're not taking into the account the fact that the most, most of the capital, right, that the ruling class uses is not for purposes of um, using it as a political resource, but for the economy. So you're basically saying, let's bankrupt the economy as a whole so that they can't use, they won't have enough money. If they don't have, let me just put it this way. If the ruling class does not have enough money to bribe the politicians, they don't even have enough money to exist in the first place. Uh, that's a really absurd way of characterizing my argument. The goal isn't to bankrupt the ruling class. The goal is to try and make it so they're unable to exert power over the proletarian. And by power... So they can you? have money. They can have money, but we can set it up. We can set society up in such a way that people are able to have relative levels of power to each other through making it so people are able to get an education, be able to set themselves up for positions where they can, you know, become like Bezos, become like Gates, whoever. They can be uh, Look, look, I, I, I don't, I don't uh, necessarily disagree with that as far as a minimal program is concerned, but the two points of contention I'm unpersuaded by. First that the means by doing this can be outside of an independent party and that second um the only po uh, that second uh, you know uh i guess what is your really what really is your point about this reformism like oh the only reason a revolution would happen is cuz we weren't we didn't take the necessary precautions to ensure the smooth success that, that's not been the point though the point is, what is we can point? reform and wait, no 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 we can reform and reform until we get to a point because a revolution is inevitable, like you and I agreed upon at the beginning of this conversation. Okay. So Let's talk reform... about meat and potatoes. Do you, did you okay. agree with Jimmy Dore's force the vote? No. It's a childish way of playing politics. Sure. You are talking, you are sitting here making all of these audacious claims about your desire to have reforms and reforms and reforms. And... For free, no one even paid you. You sitting here and opposing probably like the simplest way to actually make Medicare for all maybe possible. 
just Medicare for all in the middle of a fucking pandemic, you can't even reform your way into Medicare for all in the middle of a fucking pandemic. How are you sitting here talking about all your little audacious plans for reform? So do you think that it's, wait, 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 wait. So like I said, the conditions surrounding which people can, do you think that like one or two people who support Medicare for all in a party are going to just be able to push it and get it passed? Because this is like this really, really stupid way of looking at things. Like, but, but, but all of these Democratic Congress people are on record saying that they support Medicare for all. And that moreover, and that's them playing politics to get your vote. Well, that's exactly well, what why I'm going to Why don't you just the hold time. them to it? Why don't you just hold them to it? Because there are things surrounding, like, oh, you know, other, like, do you want Republicans to get into power? <laughs> ah, you're going to laugh. You're going to laugh. Dude, Mr. Reformist is making excuses for why you no, can't no, 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 get there's the no simplest fucking excuse reform. Here, okay, wait, wait. You're making this excuses. This is a really Dude, stupid, childish I thought you're Mr. Reformist. Been... You're going to do all these reforms. You don't have the fucking balls to challenge the Democrats about Medicare Yeah, because the establishment holds enough power over the people to make it so they can't push the reforms. Why it's that simple. Push... Why can't, why can't, why are you shooting Because this the threat of Republican seizing power, these fucking conservative liberal hacks are going to come in and take over. That's not true. That's a threat. You're talking that's about a very real threat that's to the working class. That's a fucking myth. That's not even fucking true. You're talking about no, your fucking is. ass. Who do you think's going to come see this is, this is fucking proof of why revolutionaries are better than reformists. Reformists pussy out and cave in even no, 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 when it comes I to reform. I want you to answer the question. Even I want you to answer the question. Even when it comes to reforms, you bitch out. Power. You bitch out. Even when it comes to reforms. Power. reforms. Even when it comes to the simplest, most reasonable reform, nothing radical, Medicare for all during a fucking pandemic, you bitch out. I want to get a reform done. Oh, fuck Jimmy Gore. Look, you little soy boy bitch, because I know you like calling people that. All right, wait, 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 Haz. We're being an ignorant, naive I'm little child. I'm a political strategist. I'm a political about. strategist. It's a strategy game. I'm playing yeah, the game. The strategy. What do you think it is? What do you think? You just wave your cock in the air and have shit happen? I supported Jimmy Gore. I supported the force to vote. I support all those things. Yeah, and I support Medicare for all, but him no, acting like he's just going to fucking no, remove no, OC from power, no, we have the power. No, is a stupid way of framing it. You're this is a politically it. inconsiderate, stupid way you're of framing it. You're not it. even a reformist. You're literally just a reactionary. A reactionary to what? What have I reacted to, other than your stupidity? To the American reformist progressive cause to get Medicare for all during a fucking pandemic. Yeah, so the thing is, is do you think that we're able to that simply push the vote? You think yes. that, oh, everything's happy and then we can just do. the yes, vote. I do, yes. Well, then I'm not the naive one, it's you. Yeah, and if you can't, you could kickstart a movement to literally overthrow everyone, all the sitting Congress people in the Democratic Party next midterms. I mean, so, they yeah. tried that on January 6th. That didn't go damn well, did it? What? Never fucking mind. Do you think that it's that easy to throw together a little party and have your little merry dance through Congress and throw AOC out of her little chair? Like, you can unseat the people who opposed it, even though they were on record saying they supported it, yeah. Yeah, pretty, so pretty playing easy. politics and deciding, oh shit, the Republicans are the ones who are going to seize power if I don't keep this in power. Dude, Biden won the fucking election. You can chill about the Republicans now, can't you? That's what you were saying. Harm reduction. They're still in Congress. Dude, this is, this is able to exert guys, pressure guys. on people. They said they were going to push Biden left, and all they did was become to the right of Biden himself. Biden pushed no the right. To the right of Biden here. I know you want to talk to your you chat like objectively, that. Objectively, you are, though. How am I to the right of Biden? Because the only... Because I, I bet you if Biden was, like, sufficiently pressured... He would probably like do Medicare for all if he was like. Then I'd like to all. pressure Biden into it. However, Jimmy Dore's real you, grass. You can't even, you can't even pressure the fucking congressional Democrats to do it. How yeah, are you so we're going to pressure them in any way we can. How are you going to pressure the fucking president? Do you think you can just wave your cock around and have a magical Medicare for all appear by saying we're not going to vote you back in? Do you think Jimmy Dore has the platform to sway elections? No, alone he does. No, good. There you go. You gave us an answer. You I'm screaming? so happy. You hey, gave hey us you want to keep screaming, dumbass? I'm gonna let me explain why. I, I mean, screaming seems like a viable Jimmy option. Jimmy Dore alone couldn't do it, but if all of the influencers on the fucking internet 
all of the other big ones were on board, they probably fucking could. The problem is that dumbasses like you were shooting people, shooting yourself in the fucking foot, saying, now we can't do it. You guys are the ones who fucked up the whole fucking thing for no fucking reason. I don't get it. Well, are you fucking people are you, you paid up? Why do you how fucking you cuck think yourself? Political cuck. Political no. cuck. Political you're a little cuck. You're a little bitch. You're moving with some fake movement. You have this little immaterial bullshit you threw together and hoped and prayed it worked. Dude, it's you're not gonna the, You're going to be the emperor of America, Daenerys Dylan Targaryen. You're going to be the savior of America, altruistically benefiting the working class from the reins no, of power. Machiavellian. Machiavellian. Dylan Peter Bayless from Game of Thrones. That's what you're going to be. Machi Ooh, I'm, I'm Machiavellian playing the game for the working class. Go do it, dude. Dude, go do it, you fucking pussy. Go fucking do okay, it. Go fucking do it, you go idiot. Do it. Go do it. And I'm gonna fucking laugh at you when you fail, and you are gonna fail, I promise. And your fucking movement has failed too. You have 9,000 followers on Twitch. Do you really think you're gonna and, adapt and, and, okay? and, and a few months ago, I had half of that. So I'm rising and I'm growing, and I'm not gonna stop growing. I had 200 viewers a few months ago. Now I'm at 600, 700 on the fucking regular. I'm well, rising. I hope you can go in a direction with that. You're gonna do a great do job with your 500 use, voters. Do not use my Twitch and YouTube career as an example of failure, dude, because that's the most successful fucking shit you've ever seen on the fucking internet. What a horrible fucking attempt to so fucking get your 600 followers are going to go win an election right now 600 viewers and i'm going to do way more than okay. you ever will in your whole fucking life little boy i promise you that much promise you that much i promise you that much i vow that much i vow on my ancestors grave that i will have way more of an impact on this world than you ever will Please well, prove me wrong. Be remembered as the guy who screamed at children on the internet i'm so happy we'll, we'll see whose legacy endures and lives on dylan <laughs> all right so it's like a the microphone too. Like I don't know what you did to it. You hit something, or did something, and it's been. I didn't want to say anything, but it's been sounding weird since. I don't know what you did. Me neither. Mm. Want to get into the Q and A? Yeah, let's do it. All right. <laughs> oh, God. Um. All right. So let's pull up some of the super chats that we have. Uh, from Eucalyme, Dylan, I'm on your side, but can you stop deep throating your mic? I can't understand a word you're saying. Okay, I think that's something that he did to his mic. Actually, um, you'll you'll notice it when you watch it back, Dylan. Like there was a point where you actually touched your mic or something, and it like I don't know if you unplugged something or did something. Oh yeah, no, I accidentally unplugged it. Yeah, so it's making it sounds like like echoey or something. Um, all right, so from Marcus Sargov. Uh, Dylan keeps misusing material conditions to mean standard of living. That's not what that means, kid. Read Marx. So that's a stupid fucking statement. Material conditions don't have to be standard of living. They just have to be the objective things. We like using that word around here that surround someone's life. So it doesn't mean standard of living. It can mean where they were born, where they grew up, what school they went to. It's all this fucking shit. It all matters. That would that would be actually personal background, not necessarily material conditions. Yeah, personal background, the conditions that surround their upbringing. I'm happy you came to that conclusion. I'm willing to bet you don't know anything about what material conditions actually means. Um. Okay. So. How much? Um, oh God. <laughs> From P1. Uh, thanks for the super chat. The reason reform failed is because, as Dorr correctly pointed out, the Justice Democrats did not withhold their vote from Pelosi and her seat. Simple. Okay. Um, let me see what we got here and the ones that I can pull up. Um, from Full Metal, let me see question for Haas. Do we need the Vanguard Party to end these West Wing LARP? I think uh, we need like a Netflix Vanguard Party so we can... Um dictate the future seasons of House of Cards and make sure that people won't be inspired by it in the, the way this goes. Look, it's not just that that other TV references I don't watch chat. fucking TV. Somebody asked in chat, I, I remember writing that one down, If um, asking if Dylan has seen House of Cards. I think that was from... I Hunter don't Lynn. watch TV. I really don't. Cap. I no, no, no. You can go through my Netflix right now. The last thing I watched was The Office. <laughs> Okay. Um, I can't like believe you haven't seen Game ago. of Thrones. Like, well, who hasn't seen Game of Thrones? It's terrible. I can't afford HBO. Get the fuck out of here. I've never seen one episode. Me neither. 
All right. So from Bob Jared, thanks for the super chat. Uh, why does Haas think that politics and money are discontinuous? Um, uh, it's such a silly statement. I can wait. I can he clarify and have Dylan respond? Yeah, because if you read Marx, money is to make more money. And some of that money is used to influence the outcome of political ends. So there's a discontinuous relationship. They're related, obviously, but it's not one continuity. There's a discontinuity between them. It's as simple as that. Should I respond to that? Or? Sure, if you want to. So my big issue with that line of thinking, though, is that if we want to look at reality, we see the effect having money has on the world around us. And to Just, act okay. like it doesn't matter. That doesn't, that doesn't, that doesn't, uh, that's not a response to what I said, though. Okay, well, I mean, like, if you want to talk about what Mark said, that doesn't really matter. Well, it matters, I'm looking to at, what? it matters to me. Okay, I'm happy it matters to what you. What matters to you is what Kevin Spacey said in House of Cards. And I like Mark's hey, Kevin Spacey is a, is a fun little man. Um, from Fanol, he said, what's the true definition of socialism? It seems that socialists cannot agree on a universal definition. Just curious. Um, um, you want me to respond? Yeah. Uh, a mode of production uh, whose mode fulfills social and common ends. There's only one definition I care about, and that's getting the means of production in the hands of the working class. We know, we know what Chomsky taught you. It's okay. Chomsky was right then. Base Chomsky. No, nah, he's actually full of shit. Um, all right, so let's see what we have jotted down. Oh, wait, we got another one. Um, thanks for the super chat, you climb. Um, when has revolution ever worked in the first world? Living standards continue to rise due to reform. 2% of GDP went towards social spending in 1900, now 40%. Why can't we keep reforming to 100%? Um, because literally no one would argue that the welfare state's model of um, spending money, you know, to, to like keep disabled people and old people and unemployed people afloat is a viable way to sustain an economy of scale. So that's why you can't. And the second thing is that you couldn't even maintain the welfare state that happened after World War II. It was ro rolled back in the 1970s, even in the Scandinavian countries after the Soviet Union collapsed, because there was no more any, there was no longer any pressure to maintain those things. Okay. Um. From Maxwell, uh, thanks for the super chat. Uh, question to Dylan: How do you plan to reform the labor aristocracy? I don't know. I really don't. I haven't thought about that one. Okay. I'll bite the bullet on that. I'd like to find a way, and when I figure it out. All right. So. Where um, we go from there, right? So from Java Bolt, question for Haas. You said you don't care about harm reduction. If this is true, why do you care about socialism? If the level if the level of harm is the same in a capitalist socialist is the same, if the level of harm is the same in a capitalist slash socialist is the same, what is socialism offering than capitalism isn't? This wasn't written very well. Um First and foremost, it's a philosophical disagreement with something that has its origins in British utilitarianism. Uh, I don't come from this background of utilitarianism. I don't view reality as a lever with which to uh, maximize or minimize this or that variable. It's not just about harm. It's any variable. To me, uh, socialism is about um, something in reality. It's about articulating and participating in reality in a certain way. That's what it is to me. Okay. Um, from Real Pluto, uh, question for Dylan. What, if any, Marxist works have you read? Works? I'm guessing you meant Books, like books. Okay, yeah. Should, so. Okay, um, I mean, I'd have to pull up a list. It's quite a few. I mean, I was telling Brittany before I got on stream, I reread one of my favorites, which is Socialism, Scientific and Utopian. Or maybe it's the other way around. I, I'm tired. Mm -hmm. um, I started on T. Um 
I read Left Wing Communism and Infantile Disorder. Um, I've read Imperialism, The Highest Stage of Capitalism, Communist Manifesto. There's quite a few things I've read, actually. I mean, like, you want me to, I don't really feel like going, you know. Um, unrelated, Como would like to know what Haas was eating. <laughs> uh, I was I eating uh, Ethiopian chicken uh, on rice, not on Angera bread. And the reason I had rice is because I, I don't know. <laughs> okay. space thing that was said all night by you. Um, so from Baby Tossin Bandit, serious question. I'm pretty politically illiterate, so I could be dumb. But is China actually run like a socialist communist country? I know they have the Communist Party, but the name alone do doesn't mean much, right? So China is a socialist country, and I like, yeah. I mean, China is essentially being run in, in this sort of fashion to where they're trying to at least get to communism by means of socialism and market reforms, and they they have a gradual process to which they're trying to get there with. See what else we got here. So from Red Devil's Advocate. Okay, what's they want to know what was your most embarrassing moment? I don't know if that's like just in general or um but we could just move on. You guys. Uh when your dad caught me with your mom. Okay. <laughs> I feel like we walked into that. Um okay. So um Black Lenin question for Dylan. Wait, I think I, no, I think we already read that one. Okay. Um, from Western Artifact to Haas, one of your comrades claims freedom of speech is stupid. Is this your position? Seems like if you're going to trust a worker to run the government, they should be able to talk. Um, what are my comrades? I don't know what you're talking about. At least in the <laughs> current context of big tech, I am for the maximal amount of political speech possible. I will never be behind any form of uh, political censorship on these big tech platforms. Um, let's see what else we got here from Cute Root. Ask them what happened after Stalin's death. If Hazat doesn't believe commies play, Mach what do you say, Machiavellian game? What is Machiavellian. it? Machiavellian. Machiavellian. Fuck, I can't say that word. Machiavellian. Did I say it right? Machiavellian. Yeah. So since we have a dumbass in the chat, what I actually said, um, I, I guess people needed to explain to them, was that this is not how communists can seize power from the perspective of a bourgeois state. Um, there are various intrigues and plots that happened in communist states. Uh, but, you know, we get it, dude. You watch the movie The Death of Stalin. You know, I know that's where you got it from, too. I know that's where you got that from, too. And uh, congratulations, you're so smart for watching that movie. But, yeah. Um, from Ukulim. Uh, social spending dropped for 60 to 40 percent due to neoliberalism, um, and now it's on the rise again. The overall trend is up. A small dip doesn't change that. Yeah, well, well it's almost like uh, you're making a meme. Uh, the more social spending a country has as a percentage of its GDP, the more socialist it is. Actually, that's not true. Um a lot of things can be spent in the name of social spending that have nothing to do with socialism at all. But good job, dude. Okay. Uh, let's see. I think we're kind of almost done, but let me pull up some of these, I guess. Um, you know what? I think... I think we could probably end up there. Um, all right. So if you guys want to do closing statements, final thoughts, we can do that. Uh, Dylan, you want to go first? I mean, sure. I guess my closing statement was we kind of got way the fuck off topic. Doesn't really matter. I'm sure it was still good content. And uh, yeah, we, well, I have a lot of fundamental disagreements with what my opponent said in regards to politics and economics being all like discontinuous and all of this other stuff. I mean, 
I don't know, I guess I didn't really convince him, but I hope I convinced the audience. I didn't really come with a closing statement because I didn't think we'd be here. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so Oz. Yeah, it's a shame we didn't actually get to like argue about the topics at hand, like about parties and revolutions. Um, but um, it's interesting that he thinks that capitalists um, primarily exist to hold political power and not to make profit, which is interesting, but okay. Loving the mischaracterization of my argument. Well, they're, they're, they're not discontinuous, then they're the same thing. They're not. All right, well... The um, argument wasn't that. They only exist to make profit. Well, you already had your closing statement.